So if you don't find the person, then I have to do it. Okay. Then then you need to check with me. Yes, I shall be very checking with you. So just for you to keep in mind that we have many hats and all. Yeah. Minute refusals. That's right. We've got <laughs> such a yeah. of experts that it's, it's possible we can do this. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but it's great that you know, like all of you agreed at the last minute. <laughs> like all of all. Of <laughs> oh, thank you. Did you get your meeting? I'll just go here. 
tutto. Sì.
Okay, uh, everyone, uh, we're going to get started. I think there was a, a slight um, change from the uh, program online to then the program that was printed. So apologies to people who thought that it would start at 10.40. Uh, but we're starting uh, now a little bit early, ahead of 11 o'clock. Um, so my name is um, Alex. I work for Privacy International, uh, an organization based in London. Um, and we advocate, litigate, and do research on the right to privacy, uh, working with an international network of partners um, as well. And I'm really happy uh, to be moderating this session uh, today with this uh, distinguished um, experts uh, sitting next to me who will be exploring through their different contexts and the work that they're doing at the national level um, what does it mean to be, who is on the margins and who are these individuals who are subject uh, to surveillance? Um, and in terms of on the margins, what we're exploring is individuals who are already in vulnerable positions or um, who are already experiencing exclusion um, or discrimination or stigma uh, in their different countries, either at the national level or local level, uh, and how they're experiencing different um, facets of, uh, of surveillance um, that we're seeing uh, occurring across the world. So I'm going to hand over um, to um, David um, Kay, who's the UN Special Rapporteur um, on Freedom of Expression and Freedom of Opinion uh, of the UN, um, and he'll be helping us to frame uh, the discussion that we'll have uh, for the next hour before hearing from uh, our national experts. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks, thanks, Alex, and thanks, um, thanks, Nigat, for organizing the panel as well. And thanks to everybody who's here, whether you thought it was at 10.40 or 11, it, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, so I only want to speak for a couple of minutes because there's such great people on the panel who will talk about um, the impact of surveillance on, on national communities and, um, and local communities. I think we tend uh, very often to think about surveillance from the sort of the large scale sense of how surveillance operates, uh, what its purpose is, how it's connected to, um, to maybe large scale counterterrorism operations and so forth. But one of the things that we've seen over the last several years is, um, is essentially a decentralization of the surveillance industry, right? So if we go back to 2013 and we think about the time of uh, the Snowden revelations and also uh, totally coincidentally, it was the time that my predecessor, Frank LaRue, issued his report on surveillance and freedom of expression. We go back to that time and, and much of the conversation about, about surveillance was essentially the broad scale, the broad scope of surveillance, particularly by the United States and, um, and its partners in, um, in intelligence operations, and also the broad scope in the context of how surveillance operated to sweep in vast, vast amounts of data without respect to individual privacy, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, other fundamental rights. I think one of the things that's changed over the last couple of years, while that is still an ongoing conversation and an ongoing debate, uh, we've seen, particularly through the work of organizations like Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, um, exactly how surveillance has moved from this mass uh, surveillance that, that Snowden disclosed, which again, still exists, um, but moved also to highlight how uh, individual companies around the world have made spyware, surveillance technology, available really to, to anyone who can afford it and the price is dropping. Um, and we've seen this in particular in, in places that are repressive and where the tools of surveillance that are purchased from, from companies around the world, but in particular from Western Europe, uh, where those tools are being used to highlight um, the work and to target the work of journalists, of activists, um, of regular individuals who might be uh, 
for one reason or another in a position of dissent from government. Uh, I just spent about 10 days in Mexico where um, the, the sort of the hacking and surveillance of, uh, of mobile phones, uh, you know, fr by mobile phones owned by journalists, by public uh, officials, even by international actors, uh, it was a real scandal. Uh, and yet the, the possibility of actually dealing with it and facing up to the reality of this kind of surveillance and the lack of any kind of uh, regulatory environment to deal with this kind of surveillance uh, has become more and more obvious, I think. So, um, so I think it's useful, at least for us, and I think this panel will, will really focus in on how surveillance has moved from this mass set of uh, surveillance to very targeted surveillance that has a very uh, direct impact on individual expression and on individual privacy. And, and I think that one of, the, uh, one of the questions that we should be addressing is not just, which I think we'll get to here, uh, the question of who's impacted, how are people impacted, and what rights are influenced and undermined by this kind of very um, personal, direct, sur targeted surveillance, but also what kind of regulatory mechanisms should we be talking about to, um, to deal with the spread of this kind of, uh, this kind of technology? Um, and a, a sort of a corollary to that question is whether it's even possible to restrict its spread, um, because obviously, it's the kind of uh, technology that may not be subject easily to the kind of restrictions that other forms of, uh, of surveillance might be subjected to. So I'll just close there. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's input and, um, and also uh, really encourage people to be thinking about these questions, not just of who's impacted, which I think this panel will get to, but what are the solutions that we might uh, be adopting to to undermine it. How can we do it at the local and national levels, and what are the international uh, tools that we might have to deal with this kind of surveillance? Thank you. Thank you very much, David, uh, for the for this introduction. And I think you you raised quite a few important points, particularly in terms of your mandate, working on freedom of expression. Um, you've been able to connect it to other fundamental rights, including the right to privacy. And I think that's something within the UN mechanisms um, that we need to do increasingly because we can't be talking about these fundamental rights in isolation because they're all uh, interconnected. Um, so it's great to see those those initiatives um, as well. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Joana Veron, who's a Brazilian researcher and advocate and uh, founder and director of Coding Rights uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, and she'll be uh, talking about the work that they've been doing on uh, mega events uh, and the legacies of some of the um, surveillance technologies and systems that have been put in place um, in Brazil. Thank you, Joana. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to show you quickly uh, work that we have done at Coding Rights. This is a timeline in which we mapped the changes in the, in the legal institutional environment that uh, allows for surveillance practices. So, and how it changed after a series of mega events that were announced in the country. So here, if you can see, before we had just the law on interception of telecommunications and some regulations from Anatel, the, the telecom uh, regulatory agency, money laundry legislation, and um, the, the Brazilian uh, intelligence system. But then we had the announcement of the Olympics, uh, the World Cup, Pan American Games, here. And this is what happened right after. Uh, in, in, in green, you can, say, you can see the new institutionalities that were created, but also new uh, legislation 
that were created that both uh, the legislation allow for um, other practices or other agencies to engage in surveillance activities while the institutionality that was created, broadly speaking, uh, was mostly about uh, centers that would uh, put together those agents, like the centers for operation in Rio, but also the, um, the CD Cyber for cyber security, and then the integrated center for command and control. So what happened was that before, while we had uh, different surveillance powers according to uh, the agents, like this is short infographic, says a being, which is the intelligent agency in Brazil, could have some powers, while the police and judiciary uh, were the ones that have more surveillance powers concerning access to user data, undercover, providing uh, investigations with undercover agencies, breach of confidentiality, interception of communication, or even OSINT or use street level surveillance. It was all separated, but then for those mega events that they got together in these uh, centers for command and control. And we have no clarity about uh, uh, how they are sharing the, the data and um, and perhaps data that they could not or shouldn't have access to. And then during those events and after we could see uh, that the new legislation, we had a legislation on anti-terrorism that was pushed from the, for the World Cup, but we also approved the legislation on, on criminal organizations, a panel legislation, and this particular a uh, piece of law is being used to target um, social movements. So we have cases in which uh, people from the landless worker, workers' movements have been targeted, uh, but also uh, organizations that defend human rights. And to, to end my, my, my presentation, and connect a bit with what uh, David was saying. Um, so we see, we could see in this research a change in the legal institutional scenario in one hand. In the other hand, the country also became a huge market for uh, the surveillance industry. So many of the, in, uh, the fairs for the industry, for hacking team, Finn Fisher, it started to happen in the city. We went there and they, Send the sell their solutions, and uh, the country actually bought a lot of things. We we try to use FOIA requests, and it, but it's hard to to get a sense on the materials, particularly those pertaining to surveilling internet, because we also approved a bill that um, uh, that's about. How do you say licitations, uh, public purchases that exam exempts um, government officers to declare that they have bought uh, surveillance equipment. So it's very hard to uh, have a sense on what they have spent on. But then if we go to those cases and al analyze the, the investigation practices. Then you see Facebook, uh, they, what they say, virtual patrol, that's being used uh, through uh, Facebook. So you go to the, this is one uh, file in part of the process that's uh, accusing uh, protesters during the World Cup, but then here is another one against the Institute for Human Rights Defenders and they include that they are monitoring their Facebook pages and um, and requesting WhatsApp. There, are, there were a case in which through monitoring, intercepting con communications, they got the password of uh, people from uh, the password in other uh, social networks and managed to uh, enter 
So this is a field that is not properly re regulated and we never approve. While we have all these new bills, we never approve a bill on data protection. So all this pervasive legislation are happening in one hand. In the other hand, we might have bought a lot of equipments that we don't know how they are being used. And then third thing is the um, extensive usage and monitoring of the social networks and requests for accessing WhatsApp. WhatsApp has been blocked in Brazil once because of that. And to finish, now we have this new trend. Due to the whole discourse in fake, about fake news, um, our Supreme Court for Elections have assembled a, a, a committee that has the army, the intelligence, the Brazilian uh, intelligence agency, uh, together with that court to search for fake news and fake profiles in the social networks. And I think that this trend, uh, and they are even talking to the US uh, representatives from FCC, and uh, Federal Electoral Commission, not the FCC. And uh, I, th I think that in this scenario that we, we develop for the Olympics, uh, adding this layer in a country that had a coup, and added this layer of monitoring in the elections involving the army and the intelligence that are related to, to the executive, it's uh, another very harmful trend uh, if we think about surveillance and, and democracy, the future mm -hmm. of democracy in the country. Great. Thank Thanks. you, uh, John. I, I think John's um, presentation and, and the context in Brazil really highlights um, some of the systemic issues um, that we're seeing when it comes to surveillance in terms of the lack of transparency of um, you know, the regulations, what's in place in terms of the legal framework, but also the capabilities of government and um, who can then access those. Uh, maybe, you know, in view of the Olympics and the World Cup, um, Brazil was able to make the case to, to its citizens, but also to um, oversight mechanisms in terms of it was necessary for them to take those measures um, to ensure, you know, national security and social order. Um, but what happens afterwards? What's the justification? And, and how do we work to dismantle uh, such systems that have been put in place? And even though there's little information of what, what has been purchased despite efforts from coding rights and other organizations, um, there's a you know, huge amounts uh, of money being spent on this. Um, and so it's very unlikely that they would dismantle them uh, after one event. So what, what remains and, and how is that gonna be used? And I think the examples in terms of how this has now been used to um, undermine other fundamental rights, including freedom of assembly, uh, but also just generally civic engagement um, when it comes to electoral processes as well and, and democracy. Um, so these all, what I was saying earlier in terms of we can't be speaking in isolation about these rights, um, but once one is infringed or interfered with disproportionately, it's very likely that it will interfere your enjoyment of other fundamental rights. So thank you, Joanna, for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Nigat, uh, who is the organizer of this session with her organization, This Rights Foundation, um, based in Pakistan. Um, so the Digital Rights uh, Foundation um, has been working for uh, four years now, five years. Uh, almost five uh, years, five years. Uh, and uh, Nigat's a, a lawyer uh, and human rights activist in, in Pakistan uh, and Digital Rights Foundation um, has been pioneering this work um, in Pakistan and working at the intersections of um, internet freedom, uh, women, gender issue and, and technology. So Nigat's going to share her experience on this issue. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Um, uh, so I'll be talking about the gendered nature of surveillance, uh, particularly in societies as conservatives, uh, uh, conservative as Pakistan. Uh, we, when we talk about surveillance, we mostly talk about you know the larger, uh, larger issue, the surveillance that comes from state or the big tech companies, and we tend to forget the voices of the marginalized community or the vulnerable communities who are not even heard spaces in spaces like these. Uh, 
Um, and after working for years in the area of digital rights, we have realized that surveillance isn't an isolated issue anywhere in the world. We tend to talk about the state and big tech companies, uh, but we often forget the communities who are most affected and don't even have voice against this violation. And when we add an extra layer of gender to it, uh, we see how it plays out against those minorities and marginalized groups or individuals that are already constantly fearing for their safety in public domains. Pakistan has particularly been insensitive towards the gender and sexual minorities along with other kind of persecution that we frequently witness back home. And while we are talking about surveillance, I'll be focusing on how culture and tradition plays out in, in uh, conservative, uh, conservative societies like ours. The surveillance that starts from, from our home, when we are not allowed to lock our doors, to when our brothers checks our mobile phones, um, or, um, or answers our calls because he claims, or the male elder of the family claims that he is our guardian um, and should protect us uh, at all costs. The surveillance at home translates into larger social surveillance when our neighbor are keeping an eye on us. Uh, our relatives are constantly dissecting our choices of clothes, the people who hang out with us, and calculating every minute when we are not at home. If I talk about women here from the perspective of Pakistan, we have normalized this behavior within our own heads. Uh, and I have, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I'm sorry, I just raised the point. Yeah, so a woman was, uh, it's, it's all, in, in, in our society, a woman has been given a rationale always for being washed, that they trust her, but they don't trust the world. So that their own trust issues manifest on the woman and confine her life in a glass ceiling. The main argument of our IT minister while lobbying for a draconian cybercrime law last year was the same, that we need to protect our daughters and sisters who are committing suicides because of online violence against them. Uh, now this law is enacted and mainly being used to surveil and crack down on political dissent. Surveillance that stems from home translates into larger social discourse and that affects the entire personality of the surveilled individual. An abusive partner who controls your entire life, including your mobility, who you talk to, who you work with, is as worrying as a hacker accessing your webcam remotely and filming you while you navigate your private space. The violence that each kind of surveillance, social surveillance, state and non-state surveillance result in are interconnected. We speak about how there shouldn't be mass surveillance on, on, uh, by the state and non-state level and how this is leg illegal and whatnot, but they still happen. And when they do happen, they don't, you don't know who is watching you or taping your phone at any given moment and who has access to your data at all times. In Pakistan, this is rather a common uh, occurrence where someone breaches the domains of your authority and contacts the surveilled woman to moral police them, saying that she's like their sister and how she shouldn't meet a man or a person who they don't like. The idea that only a sister and or mother should be protected is also problematic because it's put, put, it puts others at risk. Power dynamics always play their part. This person has your private information at their disposal, and you don't know what they'll do with this information, so you don't want to be rude to them because social surveillance and your conditioned habits of being the torch bearer of family's honor is at play here. The lack of good governance and legislations make things worse because there's no data protection law and the, and the available laws legalize reasonable surveillance without defining reasonable. We as women activists and journalists became more vulnerable to these watchdogs, moral policing women, when we are at the forefront of a movement with no protection at all. Um, we'd like to defy all the power dy dynamics, but I think this becomes tricky when the power that we are attempting to challenge is not just one person, but a whole society that likes to keep a tight grip on how women are supposed to behave. And it's so important when we talk about the right to privacy, the culture, the tradition uh, that we experience in our societies, it's so important to look at those cultures because this culture, the religion, the tradition basically play out while making legislations and laws in countries like Pakistan.
the context in, in Pakistan provides um, an interesting perspective of, of the need of not just looking at state surveillance, but also social surveillance and, and look, um, sorry. Uh, sorry, I don't know if anyone heard me uh, there. I think that the context in Pakistan just provides an opportunity to be exploring different facets of surveillance. Um, we're looking at social surveillance, and, and particularly when we know that the policymakers um, that are supposed to be drafting these laws, uh, that are meant to, to protect us, um, are members of that society. And so if we want better laws, we also need to be working on the individual level, on societal level, um, to ensure that that this is translated into legal safeguards, but also tech safeguards and, and enforced. Um, and I think, as, as David was saying earlier, there's a lot of focus on, on state surveillance, um, and then we tend to focus uh, less on social surveillance and, and things that are probably nearer to us uh, for, for a lot of, um, not just women, but different groups in society um, that are being marginalized or being discriminated against. So thank you, Nika, for that. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Amalia, uh, who works for Fundación Carisma um, in uh, Colombia. Um, she is originally from Puerto Rico, uh, and she's a project coordinator and researcher at Carisma. Um, previously, she was working on issues of freedom of expression and protection of journalists, uh, which ties in well with her presentation today, where uh, she's going to be presenting some of the work that Fundación Carisma has been doing on uh, women journalists and, and privacy. Thank you, Amalia. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Alex. Uh, yes, I wanted to share uh, an experience we have in, uh, in Charisma, a project we implemented two years ago where we wanted to understand uh, how female journalists, women journalists uh, uh, experience uh, digital uh, violence, digital surveillance, and, and to identify manifestation of misogyny on the internet and its consequences. Uh, but well, in a country like Colombia, where journalism is still a high-risk profession, uh, threat and violence against this group have been normalized. Uh, but it, doesn't not, does, it does not recognize when journalists are suffering gender-based violence or gender-based surveillance. And this is what we wanted to explore with this project, because the digital violence targeting women journalists are often different from those uh, of their male colleagues. Uh, in Colombia, violence, including surveillance uh, uh, activities against journalists, is understood as part of their job uh, by the type of surveillance. But the type of surveillance experienced by women and men uh, who practice this profession are not recognized and or distinguished. Uh, and the reality is that there is a difference, in, difference between cause, the job, and the forms, the discourse is used. Uh, or online uh, surveillance against women journalists is looking into the woman journalist's personal and family relationship, who is her partner, uh, if she has kids, and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition, it's pay attention uh, to her physical appearance and intellectual ability to use her against her, against her. But above all, it is very much sexualized, where the body is the weapon and the battlefield. Uh, this surveillance that most of the time take the form of an intimidation does not fall on ideas or arguments, uh, but rather on the fact that it's a woman who speak out and express her opinion in public spaces. Uh, we conducted several focus group uh, with female journalists from around the country, uh, and the discussions we have with this uh, group showed that being victim or just knowing a woman victim of uh, digital attacks has an effect on their, on their own journalist practices and the woman's behavior on the internet, particularly when it turns into self-censorship. Some of the consequences identified were that some women journalists decided to close accounts in social media or other public media, are more careful about what to say and what to publish, have asked for changes of sections in the media outlets they work, uh, are using pseudonymous or arte egos to prevent the public debate from becoming personal or violent, or have decided to abandon the journalist scene temporarily or permanently. Uh, the fear that this threat will materialize is the engine of these changes of habit, causing high level of stress, loss of income, and even their jobs. 
Uh, this also has the effect of reducing the representation of women journalists, uh, of women in digital journalism. Uh, but even more, it encouraged self-censorship, uh, preventing society from hearing female voices in journalism and reducing the participation of women uh, to not so public spaces or resonate in an era where technology is crucial for journalism. Uh, when we talk about how female journalists experience, experiences uh, differ from their male counterparts, we can highlight that the aim is to generate anguish, damage, and destabilize the victim's self-esteem and generate fear about what can happen to her or her loved ones. Uh, when surveillance is carried out on a female journalist, there is no doubt that the gender stereotypes come into play, with sanctions or aggravate expressions coming out from social cultural norms. That is, those that confirm the relationship of male domination and female subordination. Uh, the experiences also differ when we think about what triggers most of the surveillance against female journalists. There is a misconception that women are better suited to cover subjects of social, cultural, or entertaining issues. Uh, instead, male journalists are better at dealing with hard news, that is, politics, judiciary, sport. The moment a woman covers any of these hard topics, she becomes a stated target of a mostly male audience. Uh, this is why their experiences are so different. In, different from what triggered the surveillance or the attacks, the form it takes, and the consequences. And what I've been talking about is just a small sample, sample that barely scratches the surface. How technology can be used to compromise women's uh, privacy? How does surveillance from different actors affect them? How can government mainstream gender inter in, in, into internet-related legal framework and practices to address this uh, concern? These are all questions that need to be considered and confronted. There is an urgent need to understand them in order to face them and provide better solutions to empower women and promote substantial changes. Thank you. Thank you, Amalia, for, for sharing that, that perspective. And I think what the, the case in Colombia reflects is um, they need to be looking at uh, what is our problem analysis because there are different layers uh, that you're talking about. It's not only um, being journalists, but it's being female journalists covering issues that be, may be seen as more controversial. Uh, and then the implications as well vary. Um, there's the infringement on the right to privacy, uh, but then that leads to, to other um, implications in terms of um, sexual harassment um, and, and other types of violence um, as well. And so, all, the, all of the different contexts that, that were shared uh, are, are very different, and so it raises the question as to, um, you know, whether a one-size-fits-all solution is, is possible, given how um, different every context is, the actors that are involved, the targets um, of those uh, violations or interferences uh, with rights. Um, and so what does that mean in practice if we're going to be advocating uh, for better safeguards at, at those different levels? And I know David has, has to go in a few minutes, but before he goes, I wanted to see if he had any uh, final reflections um, on, on the three presentations. Well... <laughs> I guess I would I would say a couple of things. So one is, I mean, I think these each of the presentations really demonstrated uh, a kind of change in um, surveillance and also a change in the way we should be thinking about surveillance. I do think it's really important to be thinking. Uh, well, I think certainly in a in a forum like IGF, uh, we're uh, extremely focused on digital surveillance. But digital surveillance, as I think Nigat's point um, made maybe most clearly, digital surveillance is part of a broader set of surveillance tools. Um, there's still physical surveillance. There's still very personal surveillance, whether it's family or cultural or local government. And, and I, I think it's important for us to step back uh, and, and put the digital surveillance that many of us have been focusing on into that broader context because actually dealing with and addressing the problems that I think everybody up here has addressed requires not not really just digital solutions. 
um, they require broader solutions that um, that get at surveillance as a general matter, not just as a as a digital one. Um, Thank you for, for those uh, reflections. And um, we're going to actually open up to the floor now to give us uh, an opportunity to have the discussion um, as well. So um, if there are any questions for uh, our, our four uh, panelists, uh, please uh, switch on your, your microphone and maybe introduce um, which area you work in. Um, you don't have to give your name. Um, Oh, people are being shy on, on this second day uh, of the ITF. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, uh, Fabian from uh, the Copy Fighters. So, um, have you been uh, researching some about the new EU copyright reform? Because uh, the Article 13 in that reform would uh, require all uh, platforms to have mandatory content filtering and I'm very concerned about that regarding the surveillance factor. So, your thoughts on that? Uh, if any of our panelists have been uh, looking at it, have you, you haven't been. Has anyone from the audience been looking at uh, so that we can start maybe more of a conversation as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, just something very, very briefly about. So I think you're right. So what? What I understand, particularly Article 13 of the Copyright Directive to do is to flip around our normal presumptions in terms of content being uh, uploaded first and then maybe subject to some notice and takedown process. And the way Article 13 is drafted now is to flip that around and essentially require the, um, the platforms uh, to prevent the availability of unlawful content w or, or violative content in one way or another. So there's very serious problems about that for the reasons that, that you mentioned, although I think it'd be interesting to spell out how that has implications for surveillance, but it certainly has implications in, in intellectual property for how we think about our you know, what has developed over the last 20 years or so of a pretty vibrant notice and takedown process and what it means if platforms have a requirement to prevent the uploading, essentially, of content um, and what it means to, to filter content in that way. Um, I mean, I'd be interested to hear more about how you think that has implications for surveillance, but it certainly, I think, has implications for, for freedom of expression. Um, and maybe particularly artistic expression, and then if we go beyond that to thinking about how the use of filters and their development in one particular case might have a kind of spillover effect into other areas of, uh, of online life. So yeah, uh, regarding the surveillance factor of it, I mean, uh, filtering the uh, uploading of content is a form of surveilling. You have to surveil everything that is uploaded to uh, a platform. Uh, concerning minorities in this case, uh, for me coming from an LGBT community, this would actually um, not be <laughs> uh, one thing that we could implement because we don't have the budget for that. So. Uh, us as an LGBT online community would have to shut down. So this is a great problem for like all minorities. But I mean, regarding the surveillance factor, it's that filtering is a way of surveilling. So, so yeah. Joanna, you wanted to respond as well? Yeah, I'm not super aware of the specificities of uh, the proposal on copyright. But uh, what I wanted to add um, is that I've seen that now people, that people are talking mo more about AI, there is a trend to connect this with uh, uh, filtering and uh, surveilling content. Uh, and I think even like the technology doesn't reach that 
stage, but even if it does, it's gonna fail because it's gonna be programmed with the values for uh, blocking content that we already have problems with, with uh, human beings moderating, you know? So be it for copyright purposes, be it for fake new purposes, be it for moral pur purposes, um, I see this this trend uh, very dangerous, and like we have been dis debating responsibilities of intermediaries in the internet for long years now, and uh, this trend that okay now AI is gonna solve everything is like the most equivocated thing that we could think about. Thank you. Yes, um, got a question here in the front. Um, yeah, so very powerful uh, <coughs> stories from different parts of the world. My name is Jahan. I, I re I'm from Pakistan. I represent Pasha and also Bolubi. Um, I know it's, it's not a simple solution that, and also as David said, it's not a one size fits all sort of solution. But are we, we, we all know the problems and these ladies have pointed out exactly oh how severe the problems are. Are we looking at any short-term, mid-term, or long-term solutions to these problems? Because yes, talking about it is important, but looking at how we can address them seems to be something that we should collectively be looking at. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. Maybe I'll ask each of the, uh, the panelists, Amalia, Nigat, and and Joanna, maybe to talk a little bit more about the work that they're doing to, to respond to some of those problems um, and how they're integrating their findings um, in, into more concrete actions. Uh. Well, in the case of Charisma, first of all, we are learning about uh, how to uh, mainstream gender in our work, first of all. <laughs> That's the first thing we're doing. So to be able to make better uh, assessment when we are uh, looking into a new regulation, new draft uh, law, or so on and so forth, you know? That's the first thing for us to understand. And, and also together, uh, one, one part is just knowing how to do uh, gender impact assessment, to say it in a way, but at the same time, we are wanted to, I, I forgot what I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> No, but at the same time, we are trying to gather more evidence. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> we want to gather more evidence because we don't have it. As I say, this is just a surface. We were working with 25 uh, female journalists. So it's just a very small um, example. Uh, and we need to gather more evidence. So, so to somehow highlight to the to to uh, either the private sector but also the public sector you know this is what we have you know we have to uh, base our decisions uh, on, on the evidence and this is what we have uh, maybe we don't have the capacity to gather more evidence but we can highlight we can insist uh, the the other that have more resources than us uh, uh, to do something like that you know this is it's just it's very difficult to have one solution, but it's a way we are looking for, for ways of helping uh, to find new and more innovative solutions. Okay. Uh. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, that there are some uh, like short-term and long-term solutions. And when we talk about like countries like ours, uh, the long-term solution is to, you know, break stereotypes around uh, social surveillance. And it will take years and years. Even starting the discourse and, you know, discussion around that is something very problematic for people to digest in. So, uh, and we, and, and, and you as a very active stakeholder in Pakistan know that we have already started this discussion in terms of, you know, how the legislation looks like, but also in different communities, uh, be it, you know, like civil society or the traditional human rights organizations or the tech companies, that how, you know, like the women's experiences in the in the social uh, spaces, how we can sort of, you know, look into those experiences. We have produced uh, 
uh, like charisma, a, a research of uh, women journalist experiences uh, um, uh, of surveillance. Uh, so I think more more groundbreaking research is needed so that we have evidence-based research to push for policy change, but also to start a discourse even without, within our own homes and you know like our circles. I know that as a feminist and human rights uh, activist in Pakistan, when when I talk about surveillance with human rights defenders, they they have internalized and normalized is so much in their heads that they actually say oh what no matter what you do you know like the agencies or the security agencies or the state will surveil them so they have already you know like normalized this notion and we really need to you know like uh, sort of uh, challenge this discourse and stereotype that yeah that there are uh, some solutions and we can sort of so I think I also think that the that the uh, uh, the demand of uh, respecting of one's privacy right should come from the public. And that's something that we are lacking in Pakistan. And that's because of the culture and tradition that we have. Thank you, Niga. And then maybe, Jana, if you want to uh, mention a little bit of the work that in Brazil. <coughs> so, the <coughs> sorry. Um, the work that I've shown was more about mapping the playing fields or tracking the changes from the governmental perspective of the perspective of governmental surveillance and how it connects with um, the platforms and how the surveillance tools go beyond um, just the government tools, but. There is another work that we are doing on storytelling, on surveillance capacities, not only from the state, but from this uh, data capitalism that we live on. It's at another platform, chupadados.com, in which we, we flag some uh, stories about state surveillance, but mostly about how platforms and the, the massive data collection for the, their business models op operate uh, to surveil us and uh, ultimately it does lead to um, a lot of strategies on online gender violence and to a lot of experiences uh, just as uh, those mentioned by Nigat or even uh, targeting journalists, females or not. So then those two projects are projects in which we, we map the field, we try to tell stories about how this is pervasive, how surveillance is not state. It's very obvious, I think, for the audience, audience here, but um, um, beyond the, the internet community, I think it's, it's a lot to, a lot work to do in terms of uh, convincing people that privacy it's not dead, that is not the, the, the discourse of you have nothing to hide doesn't apply. And um, so there is this part of the work that is about mapping and created awareness, but then we do uh, direct advocacy in the, in the, in the policy making field, but also digital security trainings, particularly focus on women as well and LGBT QI community. Brazil is one of the countries that uh, has the highest uh, rate of killing trans people. So we also focus a lot in that community. Thanks. Before taking the, the next question, um, I, I just wanted to maybe reflect on, on what's already been said and also share some of the experience of Privacy International and, and the work that we do um, with our partners. And I think one of the things that, that keeps coming up and that was mentioned was around narratives and discourses. Um, and I think as, as we're proceeding with our, you know, the work that we're doing already, um, we need to be challenging that, those dominant narratives and using our own terms and stopping to use the terms being imposed on us by the, you know, be it companies or governments and defining security on our own terms. What does it mean for us? And I'm not saying at the national level because as we saw, there's also local uh, initiatives that need to be reflected. Um, but we need to be 
you know, re rewriting that narrative um, and using it for our own benefits to advance um, our missions and, and values. Um, the other one that was mentioned here as well, and I was on a panel yesterday with, uh, that was around research of perceptions of privacy um, in, in eight African countries and, and low level of awareness of um, people not being concerned about privacy. Um, and for me, it was not surprising to see these low percentages because when we know um, that there's just, it just reflects a lack of transparency as to what surveillance practices and policies are actually in place. Um, so if you don't know how your right to privacy can be interfered with, then maybe you are not so concerned about that it is being, into, because you don't even know it's happening. We don't, there's just, you know, it's all operating a little bit in the shadows, um, no accountability of how these are, are being undertaken. Um, and so unless we can break this cycle um, and to provide more information in the public as to what's being done supposedly in the name of national security or security more broadly, um, then it's going to be very hard for people to, um, to be aware of, of how um, it impacts them um, as well. So I think that's so important. Um, any other questions? So just to add on to what I was asking and the conversation, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the surveillance on people who are activists or involved in this becomes worse because there are not enough voices talking about it. So perhaps, uh, as you suggested yourself, that the awareness needs to be created perhaps where at university or school level where kids need to be uh, made aware of the fact that their privacy can be compromised, that there is surveillance going on constantly, that they need to be speaking up about it because the more voices that are involved in this conversation, the more chances that policymakers will uh, pay attention, especially with the voting age being 18 now in places like Pakistan, where they want that vote and with, with elections happening you know, a few months from now, this is the right time perhaps for us all to get involved and, and try and see if we can get the young people to get involved in the conversation. I completely agree, and, and one of the things um, that I know some of our partners are doing and we're also trying to do is um, not to also just work in our eco chamber, um, but some of the issues mentioned today are about social justice, about discrimination, about the rights of ethnic minorities, um, and civic engagement, democracy, and so we need to be liaising with those civil society organizations and those stakeholders engaging in these different fields um, as well and making those connections between the rights that we're fighting for and the rights that they're fighting for as well and the communities they're representing. Um, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, a question at the back, thank you. Hello, um, uh, we mentioned the, the importance of uh, hacking technologies, uh, intrusion softwares and uh, the hacking of the mobile phones and I know I understood that there was one legal avenue to deal with uh, the export of this kind of technologies from Western Europe. And uh, I would like to know, like, uh, what are your comments on the advancement of the Wazena arrangement? I guess I know that Privacy International is quite active in, in this avenue, so I would like to have your comments on this. Yeah, so it is um, an area that, that we've been looking at for, for many years um, in terms of the problem analysis we'd identified is a lot of these technologies, um, the whole industry, the whole surveillance industry um, is operating in the shadows. Uh, and like some of the business and human rights um, um, standards that have been developing, the surveillance industry has not been part of those discussions. Um, and so that is one area um, that, that, that we're trying to look at. And Yes, the Wassenaar Agreement um, it is one of, of those avenues. Um, having said that, it, it is a non-legally binding uh, agreement as well, so there's more that needs to be done um, around that as well. But I think in terms of the work that we're doing, um, we, we need to be identifying you know, who is purchasing and, and who is selling. And at the moment, that's still, even though we have much more information than ever before, um, that's still something that's not being done um, openly. Um, particularly in terms of who, who is buying um, as well. Um, there are a few cases where we think uh, it's a government that's buying, but then it could be a local authority. It depends who, who the adversary um, is in that context, but that is definitely an avenue 
that we're exploring beyond all the work that we're doing on human rights mechanisms uh, at, and in that respect we're also trying to look at the surveillance industry itself um, and, and trying to understand who are the actors and, and where there's leverage um, to be regulating um, you know, those technologies that are being sold, particularly when they're being sold to governments um, that don't have, you know, where there's no rule of law, there's no legal framework um, to ensure that the way these are going to be used, because some technologies have dual uses and could be used for um, lawful surveillance within a very restricted legal framework when we know that they're being used to target um, various groups in society that should not be subject to surveillance. Um, that's where it becomes problematic. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions uh, from the audience, so maybe just to wrap up, um, I might ask the, the three speakers to maybe conclude with a few comments as to um, what they expect in terms of um, the change that they want to see next um, in terms of supporting, supporting the efforts um, that they're doing with each of their organizations. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I really, I really want to see that these the voices that are not being heard in spaces like IGF and you know like big spaces where we talk about digital rights of the people who are not here. I really hope that you know like these spaces give them space to voice their experiences um, and also. Uh, you know, I feel that even like uh, as like organizations who are working on digital rights, we are also learning. We are learning how to respond to these challenges and issues. So um, uh, we at Digital Rights Foundation are trying to uh, create uh, and establish more evidence-based research, but also, you know, like as Jahan said, uh, you know, like reaching out to the schools and universities because it's big, because when we are talking about changing the society, we really need to start from the beginning. So, you know, like starting from uh, schools and universities and our educational institute to change the mindset that we have been there for decades and decades. So, so yeah, I think it's not a, you know, like uh, it's not a, uh, change that we are expecting, you know, like overnight or in, in just a couple of years, it will take, you know, like decades because it's so integrated in our society to challenge these, uh, you know, stereotypes. Joanna? Yeah, I totally agree with Nigat and that's why I have been investing a lot in, in producing those stories, you know, in storytelling, like getting the dating apps, analyzing their private settings, telling stories about how women have been um, harassed by not matching with someone, but then due to the fact that the databases are integrated with Tinder and Facebook, men are being able to, to connect them through Facebook because Facebook suggests them to to talk, so they, that's a way to jump out of consent that was embedded in the platform to, to harass the person in another platform due to this uh, integration of databases. Or cases in which geolocalization in Tinder was used to attack LGBT community also. So bringing those issues, because surveillance is a word that this is a scary word. This is a word that doesn't relate to uh, everyday activities. Um, but the fact is that the way that uh, the interactions we are having with our digital devices and uh, how the, the industry was built, that's based on data most of the time. Uh, we are all carrying our surveillance devices all over, no? But uh, people don't relate to that because the terminology surveillance relates more to activism or, you know? So uh, changing those narratives is being one of the part of the mandate within coding rights. And I think that could help us in the advocacy strategies as well. Am I? 
Yeah, well, I don't know what else I can say after Nigav and, and Joanna, but definitely we need more voices and we need more people working on this um, in, from different sectors. Definitely the private sector uh, will, can take a lot of advantage if it's include uh, way more uh, diversity in their teams uh, from decision making, but also from those that are developing technology. Uh, also the government uh, could, uh, be more in inclusive and more diversity to think about the problems, to think about uh, solutions and not to uh, try to restrict our rights, you know. Uh, and from our side, as I mentioned before, we need to keep uh, learning how to make, uh, how, to, how to communicate uh, more uh, effectively and easily all these issues so we have more allies from, from uh, uh, grassroots organizations and, and collectives. Uh, okay, so unless um, there are any final comments uh, from the audience, um, we're going to conclude this session. Um, in, in terms of what has been discussed and maybe some takeaways uh, for, for all of us uh, to, to take with us as, as we each go back to working uh, on our different um, mandates and with our own principles and values, I think um, the intersectionality between all of these issues um, can't be ignored. and. I think over the years it's been good to see within uh, this forum, but also others, um, those working on, on digital rights uh, and online rights, um, interacting with, um, with other organizations, maybe working on uh, you know, other issues that are emerging, be it gender issues, uh, the rights of uh, minorities, but also social justice, uh, discrimination, um, civic engagement, and anything related really to our ability to engage um, in democratic processes um, as well. And so I think in terms of, of moving forward, we need to find ways of having more of those exchanges and looking for solutions um, together so that if a new bill comes out on, you know, on data protection, interception of communications, whatever it is, that we don't just have privacy advocates um, they're advocating, but other groups that, that will be impacted um, because of the expensive um, provisions that are, that are included in those laws. Um, and I think an important takeaway as well is, is telling our stories. Um, we, we tend to you know, all be here at the IGF and you know, speaking within our eco chamber, but we need to be reaching out uh, to others to, to be sharing uh, the work that we're doing, the concerns, and seeing if there are commonalities um, that we can be working on together. Um, so thank you very much to our three panelists uh, and to David Gay, uh, who joined us earlier in the panel, and thank you for all of you for your presence and attention. And um, yeah, thank you, have a good day.